Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. One of my favorite, and if you were to ask uh, a pastor here, you know, at least me particularly, one is, what is one of the most important doctrines of the church and one, what's one of the most important experiences that I would want you to have here on earth, I would tell you that it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Of course, we want the doctrine of salvation, right? <laughs> and sanctification and being holy. Uh, but I, I'm telling you that this is part of the salvation redemption story in the Bible to be baptized in the Holy Spirit in order to fulfill salvation on earth there must have been a baptism in the Spirit in the book of Acts. Today is so important, and the next few weeks we're going to be breaking this down to help us. Although next week I won't be speaking because I'll be at the marriage retreat, so I'll be back in two weeks. But I want to set up a foundation of understanding the baptism of the Holy Spirit today so that we can um, um, be more ready to receive and seek the Spirit. And I, I know many of us may already be uh, Pentecostal and believing in the Spirit, uh, in the baptism of the Spirit, but many are coming to our church from so many different denominations that I want to help. I want to help make sure we set up that foundation. Pastor, evangelist, and a radio broadcaster for the Assemblies of God, uh, his name was C.M. Ward. He said this, Pentecostal is, a, is an experience, not a denomination. Being that we believe in Pentecost happened on, in Acts 2, and it's for the entire church for all believers, not just one denomination. And somehow being baptized in the Holy Spirit became uh, exclusive to only certain denominations. And it's unfortunate that that happened because Jesus wanted his, his power and his spirit to be poured out on all believers. And it's not exclusive for only one fellowship or one denomination. We're assemblies of God. We believe in Pentecost and being Pentecostal today, but we don't believe that it's just for us. We believe that this was a doctrine and promise from Jesus Christ for all people. And it was a basic teaching in, in uh, the first church. Hebrews 6, 1 through 2 talks about that, how it was a foundational scripture that they were to learn and then move on to deeper things. It was the milk of the word, so to say. And for some reason, uh, it's questioned today, but yet it was never questioned in the early church. In fact, you were expected to be baptized in the Holy Spirit after you believed in Jesus Christ in the book of Acts. And so we'll see some scripture like that as well as we go through this. I want to apologize to those who have had um, experiences in churches where it was um, fanatical or done inappropriately. I want to apologize to you that if it has caused you to have some kind of fear um, or, uh, you know, if you saw some bizarre things taking place, just so you know, when the Holy Spirit does come upon you uh, in power, it is a very charismatic experience at times for certain people. And, you know, for me, I was bawling my eyes out, crying. And, and for me as well, I had one time when the Holy Spirit came upon me, there was so much joy in my heart, I couldn't stop laughing. And so there are times where people are emotionally changed in that moment because think about this, the kingdom of heaven, the presence of God, who is peace, joy, love, is coming all over you. So it's going to change how you feel in that moment at times. And sometimes he is so heavy that you just kind of fall back or you fall forward or you fall to your knees and fall down. And that's why that happens because his spirit is so rich and so strong in a good way. It's not hurting you or anything like that. But some people have, had been, have been in churches where they've told you things that aren't true or they've, they've said, say these words and you'll start praying in tongues, and that's not right. That's not how you do that. We learn in our scripture today that the Spirit enables you. First of all, the Spirit comes in and baptizes you. Then he enables you to, to pray in tongues or speak in tongues. And so I just want to clarify that as we move forward. I'm trying to take away the bizarre impression that maybe you've had and let you know this was, a, this was a normal and this is a foundational doctrine in the church. And I want to show you that today. And one of the reasons why I know, or one of the, re, like, what helped me um, was that I learned more about this doctrine. 
I was in the book of Acts class in college when I started really learning more about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and able to comprehend what it meant. But the Holy Spirit helped me because the Holy Spirit was already in me at salvation, teaching me and guiding me and helping me understand who he is. But when I was in the book of Acts class, it was a night class and it was a 6.30 to 9 o'clock class. Or was it 6 to 9? It might have been 6 to 9. And uh, I'm going to just go ahead and tell you my story. So I was going to save it for the next time I come. I'm going to tell you now. So I was in class, and I'm learning about this whole experience and this promise. And uh, I said, Lord, I, I don't think I've truly had this, this uh, baptism in the spirit that I'm learning from my professor. And I went into the chapel. I'm in the back row. And I'm just telling God, I need more of you. I just need more of your power. I need all that you've promised me. And now this is pre-pastoral life. I'm just a college student learning to be a pastor, but I'm a disciple of Christ. I'm a Christian, okay? This isn't just for pastors. This is for all people. And so I'm there because I'm saying, God, I want everything you've promised me. I want everything that you have for me. And what's crazy is one of the things I did when I prayed in college and I studied and I read the word, I would listen to instrumental music just so that I didn't have words in the back of my head as I'm writing papers and things like that and or get distracted by a lyric of a song. And so I listened to instrumental music and a college student came in and started playing the piano. And he started playing beautifully on the piano. It was just, it was, it was awesome. It was powerful. And I sensed the Holy Spirit in the room like that because chills went down the back of my neck. I began to pray and just continue to seek him and all of a sudden I just felt this amazing presence over my body, over my life and I began to pray in a language I didn't understand. As I was praying and I I could tell that I could stop if I wanted to but you don't want to stop but the spirit enabled me and what it was was I, I heard I I heard different language in my head, so I began to let it out of my mouth. That's how it begins. It begins in the mind and comes out. And I'm praying out loud, and I'm seeing lost souls that need Jesus at the same time. And I'm crying my eyes out, just bawling for these souls. It was like God was like, I'm giving you my spirit to reach people like this. Come to find out later on, I went to go find him that week, that guy who's playing the piano. I said, hey, um, do you do that often? He's like, because I was thinking maybe I need to keep going back, you know? And he's like, no, I was in the library studying and the Holy Spirit said, go into the chapel and start playing music. See, God wants to pour out his spirit upon us. And so that was my first experience And of course, sometimes people wonder, was it true? Was it real? You know, uh, when I was praying in the spirit, praying in a a different language and tongues, was, was I faking that? Not really. I mean, I've heard it over the days, over the years of my life, but I wouldn't know how to make that up. It was that genuine. But I asked God to do it again. And so one time I'm driving, praying for a friend's mother who's sick on the way home back to college. I was visiting home. I'm driving. And next thing you know, I get baptized or refilled in the Holy Spirit again as I'm driving, that was a little dangerous. That was interesting. I'm like trying to see the road through my eyes being teared up and everything. That was my personal experience and I'm not crazy. I'm not insane. I'm crazy about God. I love him. But that was a a genuine, authentic experience and I've had many more since then. Let's look at what scripture says because we wanna back everything we say with scripture, correct? This was a promise of the Holy Spirit, and this is also called the promise of the Father in in theology as well. Joel prophesied about the promise of the Holy Spirit pouring out on all believers, but I'm going to use Peter's quotation of the prophet Joel on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. And this is what he said. In the last days, Peter is talking to these people who heard them praying in 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 different languages. He says, in the last days... God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, 
and they will prophesy. Prophesy being speak for the Lord. The last days, just so you know, began when Jesus came to earth the first time as a babe. That was the beginning of the last days because in Old Testament history and prophecy, when Jesus comes, it's the era of salvation under the new covenant to save all mankind from their sins. We have been in the last days for over 2,000 years. The end of the last days begins or happens when Jesus comes back at the second coming. So we are in the era of the last days, the era of prophesying or telling people about Jesus Christ and to believe and repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ. We are in that time right now. And what Joel is saying is, is that the Holy Spirit will come upon you on the, in the last days to empower you to be witnesses, to help out in this salvation redemption plan. Now, all four gospels also recorded that uh, John, John the Baptist uh, recorded, I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue tied here. John the Baptist spoke on Jesus coming to baptize in all four gospels talks about it. Now that is, when you talk about um, hermeneutical interpretation of the Bible, when you start breaking down laws of interpretation, anytime all four gospels mention something, like the resurrection, all four gospels do, it's, it's meant to be known. It was important doctrine. And this is what Matthew 3.11 says. This is John the Baptist. I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals. He's talking about Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus was going to baptize. By the way, do you, do you have, there might, that might be the reason why, I don't know if you know this. Did you ever think that maybe that's why Jesus never baptized anyone in water? John 4, 2 says that, that they were baptizing people, although Jesus did not baptize anyone because his baptism wasn't going to be a water. He didn't want us to be confused. He wanted us to understand the difference between the baptisms. And I'm going to get into that here in a minute. Jesus confirms this in Acts 1, 4 through 5. Look at the scripture. Once when he was eating with them, the disciples, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but just a few days, in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So now Jesus is talking about it himself. This is after he, um, he uh, rose again. He was with the disciples before he ascended, and he's giving them final instructions, and he's saying, wait in Jerusalem for that day of Pentecost. Wait there so that I can pour out my spirit, the gift. I can baptize you. He also says that in Luke 24, 46 through 49. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are, the, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Wow. Acts 1.8, same thing. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling the people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is all going to happen, he's saying. This is all before the day of Pentecost occurred. And lastly, it was that day, the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, kind of like this. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Remember John 3? Like the wind, the illustration that Jesus uses to explain to Nicodemus. The whole house, wind comes through. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Wow, 
that all took place in a moment in prayer on the day of Pentecost. What we're reading here, what we're seeing is this was the plan all along. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is mentioned in many different ways, like pouring out the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, the promise of the Spirit, clothed in power, receiving power. They're all referring to the same experience, the infilling of the Holy Spirit to empower believers to be witnesses of Jesus's life. And it's for generations to come, according to Acts 2, 39. It's for generations to come. Your children's children can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So what does the word baptism mean? By the way, pastor's not the only one that can do object lessons. (laughs) He's the master of them, though. He's so good at them. So I brought a little illustration, too, because sometimes it's just helpful to, to be visual. What does the word baptism mean? The verb baptize or baptizo in the Greek literally means to dip or immerse, to dip or immerse. Now, the Greeks use this word to explain how you dye clothing. So they would dip and dye, which is kind of funny because that's D-Y-E. But in water baptism, you dip under and you dye to your your old life. You dye with Christ and you come out a new person. I love that. You identify with Christ and his death and come out a new creation. So what they would do is, if this is your life, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and Spirit often has a lot of, there's a lot of water language to explain him. Pour out, drink the Spirit, baptize or submerge in, in water. What, this is the thing, what Jesus is doing, by the way, Jesus is the baptizer. Matthew 3.11. Let me say this right now so I don't forget. I want you to think about this for a moment. You've, you've already been saved. You've already been maybe water baptized. And Jesus is still with you wanting to baptize you in the spirit. Now that's an intimate, personal relationship with a loving savior. He's still with you. And he is baptizing you in the spirit because no man can do that, only Jesus could do that. And so this is what it means to be baptized. Just like in water baptism, we go under. Spiritually, what's taking place is Jesus submerges us into his spirit. We're immersed into his spirit, and we're soaking in everything. The spirit of God is just coming in into our lives and is going to change our lives. And by the way, the cloth changes, right? people are going to see a difference in you. In Acts 4.13, they said, the, the Pharisees said, they were blown away by Peter's boldness, and they said, this man has been with Jesus. People are going to go, this person is different. I don't, some people don't know who Jesus is, so they may not know how to say it. Oh, this person's been with, uh, I don't know who. They're different. See, the the Jews, they knew about Jesus because he lived. People are going to notice something different about you when you get baptized in the Spirit. You change. You get transformed. You get clothed with power. That's to be baptized. They go fully under in water. Well, the same thing in the Spirit, to be just so drenched and saturated with the Spirit that the Spirit comes out. Now, think about this for a moment. If I were to take this and squeeze it, What's going to come out is the spirit, right? Not the water, but the spirit. That's why we can't help but just pray in the spirit in tongues. He just comes out. And it's okay to let it out. It's okay. It's a personal experience. The baptism of the spirit is a personal experience, not necessarily meant for a word for the church. That's later on. We're going to get into the, the gifts of the spirit. But this is a personal prayer life with him being baptized in the Spirit. Now, you may start getting confused on the different baptisms because there's, there's a few. Did you know there's actually three baptisms in the Bible? This is interesting. I want to show you that. Check out this chart. I, I made it, and then my tech guy, Jared, he spiced it up and made it look a lot better than what I did. I want you to notice that the baptisms on the left are the different baptisms, and the first baptism is actually into 
the body of Christ. This is what 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. He's talking about you now being a child of God, being in the body of Christ. What happens is the baptizer is the Holy Spirit. When you give your life to Christ, when you believe in Jesus Christ, he places you into the body of Christ. We read that in Romans chapter eight. And you can also read that in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. He places you in the body of Christ. You are now a child of God, born again as a child of God. And the element that he does it, it's spiritual, but we are covered by the blood of Christ. We are submerged in the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ purchased us and made us new. And that's the element that we are baptized into. This is for the new convert. This is when you first are saved. This has to take place before the others can happen. It's an act of faith. You believe in Jesus Christ. You are placed in the body of Christ, a family member of God by the Holy Spirit. And what's the sign? Fruit of the Spirit. Love, self-control, patience, the Spirit of God just showing through. So the, the next two can happen at any time. The next two can happen at any time. It could be that you're baptized in the spirit first before you're even baptized in water. But I'm gonna put water uh, next because that happens a lot in people's lives. So you're baptized in water by the baptizer being a disciple maker or a pastor, minister, right? You're put into water, that's the element. This is after salvation as a believer. Water baptism is an act of obedience. Why? Jesus said to baptize people in water and to be baptized in water. It's an act of obedience. One of the first things you should do as a Christian after you believe in Jesus Christ is get baptized in water because it says you're willing to obey Jesus. And the sign is a public demonstration in front of everyone, family and friends. It's not private. It's meant to be in front of others. You're identifying with Christ in front of everyone publicly demonstrating your devotion and love to God, your heart. And lastly, the baptism of the Spirit. Jesus is the one who baptizes us. The element is the Holy Spirit. He puts us and drenches us in the Holy Spirit or pours out the Holy Spirit, different scriptures use. This is after salvation as a believer. You must be a believer to be baptized in the Spirit because you need the indwelling Spirit first before the power of the Spirit is manifested and works and covers you and pours into you. A life of service. Why would someone be baptized in the Spirit? One of the reasons why is because you've committed your life to serve God. I'm gonna get into that a little bit more before we're done here today because that's important we understand. What's the motive? What's the purpose of being baptized in the Holy Spirit? And the, the, the sign, the first sign that we see in people is they begin to pray in tongues in a language they'd never prayed before, a heavenly language. That's the sign. So there you have it, three baptisms in scripture that we may not even realize and they're all right there and in all different ways. I love what R.A. Torrey says. He says, in regeneration, so the first one, salvation, the first baptism, there is the impartation of life by the Spirit's power, and the one who receives it, it is saved. Is saved. In the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there is the impartation of power, and the one who receives it is fitted for service. The Holy Spirit comes to fit you for service to work in the kingdom of God, to serve God. Let me give you an example. Let's turn to uh, Acts chapter eight. Acts chapter eight. And we're gonna pick up at, at verse nine. But because I have some time, I'm gonna read the verses before it. Acts chapter eight and verse four it says, Philip preaches in Samaria in my Bible. It says this, but the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Powerful ministry, empowered by the Holy Spirit. A man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years. 
amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. This is his reputation, Simon's reputation. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. So we have witchcraft happening in this time of this story. And it happens today. By the way, the movement of witchcraft is, is on a rise, especially in our young generation. I just want you to be aware of that. Are we going to face it by ourselves or are we going to face it with the power of the Holy Spirit? Because it looks like that's what we're supposed to do here. But now the people called, or, but now the people believed Philip's message. So instead of Simon, the sorcerer, now people are believing Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice something here, that the power of God appears to be greater than the power of witchcraft in this city. And Philip was empowered by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, used by the Spirit. That is the only way we're gonna overpower demonic forces. The only way. Then Simon himself believed so now the sorcerer, the famous one around town, has believed and gets water baptized. It says, and he believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went, and he was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip performed. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers, so they're already believers. They've already been baptized in the body of Christ regenerated, saved by the Spirit, born again. They arrive there and they say this to the new believers, receive the Holy Spirit. They prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, meaning water baptism. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers and they received the Holy Spirit. Do you see how that can be a little misconstrued? There's a lot of different baptisms happening there. They, had, they already had the spirit indwelt in them to regenerate them and make them born again. We learned that. That's why I'm going in the progression I am in this series. But now Peter and John acknowledge that they're believers, but they have not received the power of the Holy Spirit yet. They have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit that they need to have, the fullness, the full experience of his spirit. And so they go and they pray over them they laid their hands upon these believers and they received the Holy Spirit. Now here's what's fascinating next. This is not on the screen, but I wanna read it. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given, interesting, Simon saw that the Spirit was given. How do you see the Spirit unless there's a manifestation of the Spirit physically? So scholars believe he heard and saw a change in them, but he heard them speaking and praying in tongues but I'll give you some better evidence here in a minute. When Simon saw the spirit was given, when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. You can't buy the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't earn it. You can't purchase it. See, he was a new believer, a new convert. He wasn't ready for this. He didn't understand yet. That's why, I'm, that's why we're teaching here today to understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because you can't earn it. It's a gift. I have a gift back here. Did you notice yet? It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. You can't purchase it. His heart was wrong. He wanted it to demonstrate power, not to glorify God. Ooh, that's good. Because some of us may have the wrong motive for wanting to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we need to be real careful that it's to bring honor and glory to God and to serve him. He said, let me have this power too. Verse 19, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. Well, that's nice, but you could tell his heart wasn't right. But Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. Ooh, you can have no part in this for your heart is not right with God. There's the gift of discernment right there. Peter is practicing the gift of discernment, knowing the difference. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts, for I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held 
captive by sin. Wow. It's no joke. It's, to Peter, this is not a joke, and it's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't use it for yourself so people can go, man, that person must be, wow, that person's special. Look at him. Look at her. Nope. When we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's actually a greater responsibility of dying to self and being more like Christ. It's all about glorifying God, not glorifying yourself or bringing attention to yourself. How do we know we're baptized in the Holy Spirit? I've already answered it. It's the initial physical evidence, speaking or praying in tongues. It happened in Acts 2, 4. It's implied by Simon in Acts 8, 18. He sees a difference. He notices something. But look at, uh, I'm going to read Acts 10, 45 through 46 for you. It says, the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on all the, on, on the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. So this happened after they prayed for them. Actually, they were actually preaching the word to them and the Holy Spirit just came upon them. It was awesome. And they're speaking in tongues and praising God. Acts 19, 6, the believers in Ephesus, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. So there we have a pattern in scripture that the initial evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit's power is to pray in tongues. And this was normal to Peter and John and the apostles. And this was normal to Paul who wrote around 12 to 13 books of the New Testament. What am I trying to say? It's not weird. It's not wrong teaching. It's accurate. Baptism of the Holy Spirit was authorized and promoted by Jesus himself, by the early apostles, and it continued throughout church history. And we see signs of it in AD 300, 400, 500. And we see an outpouring where the Assemblies of God came from in Azusa Street in California. In the early 1900s, the Holy Spirit is not done pouring out his power on believers. Praise the Lord. Why, why speak in tongues, though? Well, one of the things scholars will say and theologians will say is, and I agree, speaking in tongues gives believers assurance that they have indeed been baptized in the Spirit. It's a sign for you as well. So why be baptized? Let me close with this. Why be baptized? Well, first of all, this is going to be really simple. Jesus wants to baptize his followers in the spirit. Jesus wants to. Jesus wants you to be baptized in the spirit. How do I know that? Well, Acts 1, 4 through 5. Luke 24, 49, he told his disciples to wait for this spirit to come, for his baptism to come. But Luke eleven thirteen, 13, we actually overlook this quite often. But it says this, so if you sinful people, this is, about the, this is on topic of prayer, and Jesus is saying this, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Praise the Lord. Jesus wants to baptize you. He is the baptizer. He wants to just dip you and saturate you in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. What's another reason why? Because the baptism of the Spirit is a birthright and promise gift for all of God's children, for all believers. It's a birthright when you give your life to Christ, when you become a child of God. It is a gift sitting in your life waiting to be received. By the way, I wrote a note in the bottom of my outline, don't forget the gift behind you on stage. <laughs> on purpose, because the church has forgotten this gift. The church has forgotten this promise. The church has avoided it and tried to question it and negotiate out of it and talk out of everything the Holy Spirit is here for us. He is here. And, and why? Why would we need this? If we have already been saved, if we already have the word of God and the life of Jesus to learn from, why would we need it? More of his power. Why would we need more of his power in our lives? Because it acts 1-8. 
Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. There it is, that's the key. You will be my witnesses. The baptism of the Holy Spirit transforms us, this is why, to be powerful witnesses in a world that Jesus longs to save. The reason why they were being baptized in the Spirit is because Jesus wanted the whole world to be saved and he wanted to empower us to do it. The reason why Pastor Kuhn had a stick of dynamite up here is because the Greek word is dunami or dynamis can mean, and that's where we get our English word for dynamite. Power, explosive power, dynamic power. The one Greek interpretation of this is dynamis. It comes from a verb that means to be able or to have strength. Who needs strength right now to be a witness in our world? I know I do. Praise the Lord. The baptism of the Holy Spirit brings the personal power of the Spirit in your life to help you shine and be a witness for Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, power refers to the working of miracles, power for bearing witness to Christ and power over the devil. The baptism of the Spirit gives us power and influence to help people believe in Jesus Christ, to help them convince them that they need Christ. The Holy Spirit will work through your words and through your actions and your gifts to help people go, whoa, I need what you're talking about because the Holy Spirit will work through you. That's why we need his power. I want you to take this away today. God wants his church to be a movement, not a monument. This Pentecost day was not a monumental moment. It was a movement that would never stop because, the, because salvation's not over with yet. That's why I'm not a cessationist. I don't believe this has ceased with the early church. It is, I'm a continuous because the command to make disciples continues. It has not stopped. If, we, if they needed the spirit then, we need it even more now in the last days, in the latter last days. Oh Lord, forgive us for not seeking more of your spirit. Forgive us for God for, for being a monument instead of a movement. If you've been stuck, if you've been afraid, if you've been timid, know that you don't have a spirit of timidity, but of power. That's the Holy Spirit. If you have, if you have tried to be a witness and it didn't work, I wanna encourage you to try this time with the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not go alone. Do not go into your workplace. Do not go to your neighbors or to a stranger or do an event here at the church. Do not come without being empowered by the Holy Spirit or do not try without the Holy Spirit because you never know who you're gonna run into. They need, they need Jesus and God has given us the power to help communicate that message of Jesus Christ. A demonstration, and I'm gonna get into that as we continue our series. The church of Jesus Christ is not weak. We have not been given a spirit of fear to many, but of power. We're not a weak church. Simon changed, he had some work to do still. Simon the sorcerer, he was a new believer. <laughs> He had the wrong motive for receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it's because of the Spirit working through an everyday person named Philip that an entire city was coming to Jesus Christ. That's what we need here in Dover, Delaware and beyond. From starting here and, and spreading out throughout Delaware. If the followers then needed the power of the Holy Spirit, we need the power of the Holy Spirit today. So do you believe this promise gift, this promised gift is yours as well. I'm gonna talk about seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit next time we come back, but I wanna give you an application now. Seek, begin to ask, begin to ask for this gift. Seek with Jesus. If Jesus is the baptizer, ask him to baptize you. 
It may happen today. It may happen in the, in the, some people, they're, they're baptized all by themselves. Some people are there in a group, small group praying. Some people are in a large service during worship and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. The point is, is this gift has been there the whole time. It's been here the whole time. And what's interesting is the whole time, it has already been open the entire time. The spirit has already came out. <laughs> he already came out. The gift has already been pouring out. The question is, is will we look back at this history? Will we look to Christ? Will we look to him and say, Lord, baptize me in the spirit? This is a powerful gift just sitting around in our lives that we can have. I'm about, I'm about to go to a school tomorrow. I've been invited again to go to a world religions class and talk about Christianity. Almost every single time I go in there, the students have a lot of questions to counter Christianity. A lot of, a lot of difficult questions. I love it. I love letting them ask questions. And I can feel the Holy Spirit giving me things to say. I can tell. I can feel him moving. And I'll share stories and all those things, right? Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But at first, they're very, they're, they can be very um, combative at first very antagonistic towards us as Christians. Now I do it in love and a lot of grace, but I also tell the truth. And would you know, almost every single, I mean every single time, but multiple, almost every single time, multiple kids. So every single time this happens, either at least one kid or multiple kids almost every time come up to me afterwards and go, so where's your church? What time are your services? Uh, I wanna know more. Wow. Praise the Lord. I wouldn't dare go into this school tomorrow without praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to help me. Because there's kids practicing witchcraft. There's kids lost in homosexuality and transsexuality, all of that stuff. There's kids lost in lies and, and it's, it's bad. And the only thing I can do is trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. Can we, can we pray for a moment? Because this gift, this promise is for you today. Holy Spirit, thank you for your word today. Thank you for this foundational, fundamental doctrine of our church. It's more than a doctrine though. It's your, it's your spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, we can't be witnesses, effective witnesses without your help. And you have gifted us with the promise of the Spirit, the power, the dunami, dynamis, dynamic power of the Holy Spirit to work in and through us. Lord, be with me tomorrow. Lord, give me the words to say. Lord, I pray for healings and signs and wonders. I pray, Lord, you would open their hearts to receive. When I tell them what the gospel is according to Christianity, I thank you for this opportunity, God. I pray that you would clothe it with your spirit and may they receive May they want to know more. May they want to visit, Lord God. God, I pray for my friends in this church, in this room, and online. Lord, I pray that they would have the same prayers and that, God, as we seek to be witnesses for you, your Spirit's power would just come alongside and empower us and baptize us in the Spirit. Lord, dip us, saturate us in your presence. We can't do this without you. And you didn't want us to. Thank you for that. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we thank you for this gift and the promise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.